Awesome. Jesse has a lot of voice in me, so that's why that was her part tonight. Um, but my name is Emily Mooney. I'm a fellow here at R Street. I work on juvenile justice, policing, and reentry issues. And it's my pleasure to kick us off tonight. Uh, we're going to begin with a quick overview of our youth probation policy study. And then Jesse's going to moderate a panel with our two lovely guests who I'll be introducing. Um, and then we're going to have more time for drinks and fun because that's R Street fashion. So thanks for coming out here tonight. Um, as many of you know, probation is the most common sanction awarded to youth in the justice system. Each year, hundreds of thousands of youth cases end in a term of probation, but unfortunately, many of those cases ultimately result in another youth who is recidivated and failed to get the services that they need. Um, we believe that we can do better. In our report, we lay out a new vision for the youth probation system based on four key tenets. The first tenet states that we must bolster our first line of defense. That's our parents, our community organizations, educators, members of our church, um, to get involved with youth and to support them instead of our justice system. To do this, we must greatly limit the justice system's response to nonviolent or simply immature youth behavior. And practically, this means schools need a chance to collaborate with community organizations and a chance to revise and refocus on their school disciplinary policies. Second, we must minimize needless uses of probation by ensuring we have a legal system equipped for effective diversion. This means expanding law enforcement officers' ability to divert individuals prior to an arrest, as well as the discretion awarded to court intake officials. We should be able to give these people an opportunity to refer you to services instead of traditional criminal justice involvement. In all cases, you should be served according to their level of need, risk, and those services should be responsive or anticipate their likely responses. Diverting low and moderate risk youth whenever appropriate should be the preferred option, but diversion should not just simply be limited to those cases. Third, we must reorient probation's role in the youth justice system. Probation should be predominantly used to hold youth with higher risk levels and those who are in need of more intensive services accountable. It's thus important that youth receive individualized services that take account for those risks and needs and that probation plans include active family involvement, one of the greatest protective factors against future delinquency. Moreover, probation periods should not be overly long and should reward youth for the progress that they make towards the goals. Periods of probation should not be extended for commonplace technical revocations or violations, but should only be extended for true circumstances in which there is a harm presented to a person or community. If a young person struggles to comply with their probation requirements, instead of threatening them with a revocation or a term of incarceration, we should be working with them to see what they need in order to succeed. Many jurisdictions have already embarked on this journey of transforming youth probation. For example, in Pierce County, Washington, youth who fail to meet expectations or violate rule of probation may be held accountable by simply taking away certain privileges rather than a simple stint of incarceration. And in Lucas County, Ohio, a special misdemeanor services unit works with youth who have been adjudicated for a misdemeanor offense or have been referred for a first-time nonviolent felony to refer them to services instead of probation. Many of these jurisdictions are making great progress, and it's our job to be on, to work alongside them to expand their progress to other localities and embrace a better version of youth probation today. Thank you. And now I'm going to transition and do a short introduction for some of our lovely panelists here today. Um, first, in the middle, we have Shamelin Henderson. She's an 18-year-old District of Columbia native. Born and raised in Southeast DC, Shamelin aspires to become a lawyer. So for all the lawyers in the room, Dr. Shamelin. Um, a product of the juvenile justice system, she's an outspoken advocate against injustice and is determined to make a difference in the lives of her siblings and in the larger community. In order to show solidarity and her commitment to making change, she regularly volunteers in and around the District of Columbia and even lobbied Congress for the passage of the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act. Additionally, Shamellan serves as the current president of the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services Youth Council. She's a graduate of Luke Seymour High School, and she will be attending Virginia State University on August 9th this year. So, yeah. yeah. And then to her right, or left, so our right, um, is Asante Lang. She's a program manager for DC's Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, Strategic Planning and Partnerships. And she previously served as a program manager for the DCYRS's Achievement Center Initiative, which she helped to develop herself with her deputy director. Prior to working for DYRS, she ran youth adult borough centers for two at-risk high schools in New York. 
She has extensive experience working collaboratively with other partners to reform the juvenile justice system. And Asante received her bachelor's degree in public justice from Oswego State University and her master's degree from Long Island University. Then we have Jesse Kelly over here in the white shirt, or black dress, um, who's overseeing our criminal justice team's government affairs and is responsible for overseeing criminal justice efforts across the United States at both the state and federal level. In addition, she manages our street state policy portfolios for Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Jesse previously served as a legislative counsel at the Marijuana Policy Project and worked as a criminal defense attorney in Alabama, where she also helped with juvenile cases. Jesse has a bachelor's degree in English literature from Troy University and a Juris Doctor from the University of Mississippi. And now I'm gonna let Jesse take the panel away. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Okay, I think that we should maybe get started with a little bit of history background. Asante, would you mind just sort of telling us how DC probation works? Sure, um, so uh, DC has a bifurcated system, meaning there's a front end and a back end as it relates to juvenile justice. So um, our front end system is actually falls under the court services jurisdiction. So a young person is typically placed on probation for about a year or more. And if they are compliant, then they're taken off of juvenile probation. And if they're not, they're then forwarded to the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services where they're now in the deeper end of the juvenile justice system. Um, deeper end means they were either unsuccessful on probation and or they pick, picked up a more serious crime requiring additional monitoring. Okay, thanks. Uh, Shamelin, if you wouldn't mind, would you share your experience with the DC juvenile probation system? Um, my experience was, um, it was difficult because I was dual jacket, I was in foster care, and a lot of my um, probation officers, I was handled differently. Like, it wasn't no parent that they could call, so, like they just treated me different. Like it wasn't. I didn't like it. <laughs> How long were you on probation? For like a year and three months. Okay. And did you think that there was anything at all that maybe worked well for you? Um, yes. One thing they connected me with the Georgetown Spags program, and it kind of like helped tutor me like with my math and stuff and school. So that was a positive for me. That's great. And could you tell us a little bit more about? the things that you found to be problematic or maybe overly burdensome for you? Um, having to be in the house by 5 o'clock and I got out of school at 4.15. Yeah. So that was um, a problem. Um, so so what happened? Like, because I'm, I'm sure there were days that like you, you couldn't make it because of public transportation. Yeah, or public transportation, like, weather, like today. Yeah. Um, that's yeah I think everybody had those yes. long Google mm -hmm. heads because of the weather today. So. Yeah. Um, it will be like same thing, like with the um, uh, ankle monitor or um, the probation officer I had, I was sent down um, through service center because they didn't really understand my situation. Sure. Like I was going to school in Northwest and lived in Southeast, and there's no possible way to get there at 5 o'clock from 4 15 getting out of school. So, so 5 o'clock, I'm guessing, was the sort of the office's standard. So it's called 24. Like, what, like, once you leave out the house, like, you go straight to school, and once you get from school, like, you go straight home, basically. Okay. That's really tough to handle. Um, so do you think that you, in your special circumstances, and then also think about maybe uh, others that were just on probation, mm -hmm. do you think that you could have been better served by something that was different? Yes, a lot of I know. I like I had a lot of friends that also went through the juvenile probation system, and they were unsuccessful, like getting home at five o'clock too. Like one, we're teenagers, like we're fifteen and sixteen years old. Like, who wants to go in the house at five o'clock? Like, <laughs> and then like even like in the summer, like even if you're not in school, like there still would like be a curfew from a probation in the summer. So I know a lot of people that were unsuccessful from that, and some of our childhood was kind of taken away. Been down youth services center when just like wasn't in the house for 40 and 45 minutes like so. yeah I yeah I didn't want to go in at 5 p.m. Yeah. I remember um Asante do you want to do you want to weigh in here maybe with what you think could be a better option rather than maybe the curfew or other more specific harsher terms that probation carry sure I think in general one of the things we try to do at DYRS is we really work collaboratively with the courts so we actually have a pre-commitment unit and that pre-commitment unit works on the planning process, 
for this young person if they potentially come on board with us. And um, I know that one of the challenges that we have or, you know, one of the strikes, sometimes judges are not impressed with what we're doing is we take a look at the case plan to see if it was a viable case plan. So if it was determined that this young person is unsuccessful because of mental health, substance abuse, and or treatment, and that young person never received it while on probation, we wouldn't go straight to detention. You know, we would find alternatives. We would try to put those services in place to see if it would help to make that young person successful first prior to the revocation process. Absolutely, and that's something that's really different in D.C. I, I practiced in Alabama, my, my mom's a juvenile probation mm -hmm. officer in Alabama, and just the idea of having that individualized case plan, I think is some states uh, are just are not even there yet. Um, so it's certainly a conversation that, that D.C. could have with other jurisdictions to say, you know, this is one really good thing that we're doing. Absolutely, we actually had a tour this morning um, with uh, Virginia, they were from, not Winchester, Newport News. They were visiting because they're taking a look at revamping their system and they wanted to see what we're doing here. And we talked extensively about that front door entry. In order to really make changes within the juvenile justice system, we had to have a focal point of focusing on our front door. Are we receiving the right cases? I know I came aboard in 2012 and during that time frame, um, at that time we had over a thousand kids committed. Presently we have under 200. And I would like to think that that's because of all of the advocacy and the engagement and those opportunities for young people to thrive and be engaged after hours. A number of our young people uh, come from areas that are unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Young people don't exist in vacuums. They come from communities. And if the challenge is that they have to leave their community and go through an alternate route to get home, you know, we have to take public safety into consideration. And that's one of the things that we try to do at DWRS. We, we focus on positive youth engagement. Shemelin is actually, um, she works at our youth cafe. We just opened the youth cafe. We have a partnership with uh, Starbucks where they provided their materials to us and their customer service training. And um, they went through a, how long of a week training? Did you guys go through four weeks, five weeks, two weeks? They went through a two-week training, and they started off by serving drinks and, you know, opening their cafe downstairs just to us. And it was agreed upon that if we had a young person that thrived really well, perhaps Starbucks would pick them up as a young person. And that's what we really try to do is focus on strength-based initiatives. Um, we have a strong vocational training program. We have a workforce development department that doesn't only focus on our young person, but we also focus on the entire family. We have a credible uh, messenger program, which is comprised of mentors that not only does our young people get a mentor, but our family gets a mentor as well. So that if there is strife within the family, there's an advocate for each person when you come to the table. That's great, building family connections. Is Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it, it must have taken so much time and patience and dedication to get that admittance number down to, to 200 where it is. Um, I hope this is a fun question. If you had a magic wand, either of you, and could just wave it and change one thing about probation right now, especially for juveniles, what, what would it be? And could you tell us why? You want me to go first? Um, I think that proba probation needs to be more strength-based to focus on the entire family. I think when you think about youth, you have to understand they come from a family. So if you can provide the support to the entire family, I know one of the things that we struggle with is our families that struggle financially. Um, sometimes a young person is on probation because they're about to be evicted and this young person is feeling like they need to commit crimes in order to, you know, feed their family and or be a part of that scenario. I think that if pro at the probation stage, if there was more funding provided for our families that focused on basic things, clothing, food, shelter, um, even establishing, and this is at DWR's part of what we're doing, establishing relationships with PEPCO, you know, different programs that would help our families when they are in need. I think it's important to understand that youth do not exist in a vacuum. Definitely. Um, I would say for probation officers to like hear us out because instead of like most times they have like this rule book that they have to like follow about like if you're not in the house at five o'clock three times you're getting locked up like um hearing us out and hearing our issue like listening to us like that will like really i mean change like i feel like 
you'll kind of be on my side instead of against me. I feel like you're with me if you just mm -hmm. listen to me. Yeah, to have an advocate rather than someone who's trying to oversee yeah. everything you're doing, definitely. Um, is there anything that, that you wish like the general public knew about your experience that, that may be something that the public doesn't understand or doesn't see that, that you have a unique perspective on? Just the, I think maybe just the idea that, you know, juvenile probation officers and, and others maybe just don't understand where you're coming from because things were, were really difficult while you were on probation. Um, like, I don't know, I just wanted them to, like, hear me out. Like, my, I had the same probation officer, like, every time. And, <laughs> so, like, like, he was like, you're back again? I'm like, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> like, but, um, like, just listening to me, like, hearing me out instead of, like, I don't know, giving me like, I don't know. Sanction. Yeah, like, yeah. it was like you judged me before you already really knew me. So it was like, mm -hmm. if I wasn't in the house, and even like if I would tell them, like, if I was like, oh, I wasn't in the house because of this, this, and that, like, I had to go pick my brothers and sisters up. Like, you like know what you did last time. You judged me up for that. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a great example. So I'm going to feed off that a little bit. Um, and your example of not being home by five, and maybe you get like three chances and you're out. Um, what do you think would be a better way, rather than these sort of sanctions for technical-based violations, um, what's a good way to hold people accountable? Um, and incorporate flexibility, which yeah, is the goal. Um, I think, well, to incorporate flexibility, I think that they should start like a, a credible messenger program between them because if we're not able to get there by 5 o'clock using public transportation out, credible messengers or mentors can transport us or we'll have somebody reliably that you can also trust too. Like if we say we're not in it because of a certain because of a certain um, situation, if you are listening to an adult that's also like paid by y'all, like it's like coming from y'all, like you would trust that. Um, mm. That's what it get. Mm. That. So maybe like but truly, I think what I'm hearing from you is that you want someone who is on your team. Yeah. And and if that's not gonna be your probation officer, then you want someone there to help. you. Because, like, in the courtroom, like, if you're about, like, if you, like, I don't know, violated a couple of times and you go in the courtroom, you, you don't really have nobody on your side. Like, I mean, you're a public defender, but most times the judge don't listen to the public defender. So it's like, thank you for doing all that you can, but they're not really listening. They're listening to your probation officer, and if he's recommending this because you didn't follow this, like, it's really you in that courtroom advocating for yourself. Mm -hmm, yeah. And most times you don't get to talk for yourself. There's going to be It's this. a sheet, and they're reading that. Yeah. So. There's going to be an entire like attitude shift yeah. from the officials in the judicial system. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, okay, this is an unprepared question, but I'm so interested about how DC is bringing in employers to work with young people. Uh, is that more of a workforce development, or maybe like um like a self-esteem development, or both? Um, I think at DWAS, it's both. One of the things we're really trying to work on is the full continuum of care. So we have a workforce development department. We have an ed education department. We have training and vocational training opportunities um, that occur at the achievement centers. We've had a partnership with UDC where we offer three different programs, medical billing, um, child, early childhood development, and HVAC. HVAC. Mm -hmm. We have plumbing yeah. certification. <laughs> Barbering, <laughs> barbering, cosmetology programs. Um, one of the things we're trying to center and focus on is skill-based learning and training, but also the full continuum. It's one thing to have 10 different certifications, but if you still can't, if you're not employable, it's not helpful. So our workforce development department is attempting to establish those relationships with our community partners where they're agreeing to allow young people to work while on internship but then agree to also take them on full time if they keep them for six months while DYRS pays them. So just making sure we have a strong continuum. And, and you know, there's a lot of gentrification going on in the city, and that has a major impact on our families. So one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that our young people are prepared um, and feel well. They learn about advocacy while with us. Shamela has been giving herself a whole lot of credit. She's come a long ways, and she has a lot to say, and I'm so surprised she's so shy right now. But she has a lot to say about change. She's hilarious. So just today, we were coming here, and I didn't pick her up on time because I was running late for a meeting, and she went sent an email to Neela like, 
Nila, I'm so sorry I'm unable to attend. However, my African kids did not show up for me. Shamel and I'm upstairs in the building, but that's what I taught her. That's fine. That works for you. You hold people accountable, even if it means holding me accountable, you know, and that's one of the things that we try to do, give our young people a voice. We have a youth council that engage in active community service in locally, nationally, and internationally. We've been to Jamaica and partnered um, with an orphanage there. We've been to the Dominican Republic, taught young people how to speak English. We've helped out in different hurricane situations. Just letting young people know that you have a skill set, even if you don't know how to define it yet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's important to us. And even with Shamela, she's the president of the Youth Council. And she's the first one when something is not working, oh my God. And she sent <laughs> yeah. straight up the chain to the director, like, you guys have a problem and I need you to solve it. Yeah. Because it's not working for us. And for me, that means that we've done a good job. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we want. And I tell her, if you want to see a change in the system, then change it. Mm -hmm. Only you can do it. They don't listen to us, but they listen to you when you all write. Definitely. Even though I don't like that she, you know, sometimes writes about me. <laughs> you know, I'm okay with it. <laughs> So I'll address all of you. We, we're not going to take audience questions here because we wanted this to be a conversation night. We titled it a conversation on juvenile justice. So I'm going to give the ladies one final question, and then we're going to wrap up this sort of uh, event-based portion. So you all can come up, introduce yourselves, and, and really make that, that connection here. So my last question for you is, we're here, right? We're your audience. We want to be an advocate for change. And, and most of us are members of the D.C. community. What do you want us to do? Um, I want you to stick with them. Unfortunately, we only have young people for a short period of time. And even as DYS leaves, we still provide them some form of support. But I need you all to continue to advocate for them. I have young people that, you know, we lobby for them not to be suspended you know, the minute the school is upset with their behavior. However, after we leave, we're no longer there, so they treat our kids like second-class citizens mm -hmm. and suspend them immediately. I need mm -hmm. for you all who are advocates to continue doing the job even when we're not there or continuing providing the resource. It really takes a village. It's a hard thing. You know, young people are adolescents, and they go through development, and, you know, I want you all to stick with them as we continue to. Building relationships, um, I feel like um, if you're like, like, like she said, like if you're not, like, I don't know, I don't know if you, like building relationships basically, like even if you're not a mentor, you're kind of a mentor. If you come, if you come in my life and you're there a lot, you're kind of a mentor. So just building relationships, letting me know that I can trust you, letting me know that you're on my side. Mm -hmm. That's really key. Okay. Well, let's give them a big round of applause.